Hello everybody, I'd like to welcome you to our Sunday service and if this is your first time with us, special warm welcome. I hope you'll really feel part of our online worshipping community today. Coming up later we've got Note some notices. We've got Bible readings from James Reed, prayers from Reverend Linda Bedford. We've got a special message from the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, I'll be preaching for you as well. And we've got a lovely selection of, of favourite hymns too. So I hope you'll enjoy your time worshipping with us and that you'll encounter the Lord in that worship. Shall we start with those notices? First of all, let me say how nice it is to be back. The last few weeks we've been pre-recording these services several weeks in advance, which is why the prayers probably got a little bit out of date. Um, but it did mean I could get away on holiday with my family. We've been in France for the last couple of weeks, uh, which was lovely. And it's why I've got a rather nice tan now. Uh, and I'm also scared of looking at the scales. On the plus side, my hair is a lot shorter, which is a, a good, good thing. It's nice to finally get a haircut after these long months of starting to look like Chewbacca. But we did have a good holiday. We visited Paris when it was completely deserted. That was a very strange experience, but, but very much better than the last time I was there when it was heaving with people. I got to jump in the sea a lot and also got to experience a, a rather wonderful mountain river in the Pyrenees, uh, just, just swimming in a very swift, deep river. It was fantastic. And we generally just had a, a great time. Uh, so a big thank you to everybody who held the fort while I've been away. Now, let me tell you what's coming up this week. If you fancy a real life church service today, well, we're meeting at half past nine in Upton and 11 o'clock at Welland. And I think the Welland one is going to be out of doors, uh, which will help with social distancing and various other rules as well. Next Sunday, we have services in Ripple and Hanley Swan at half past nine and then also at Earl's Croom at 11. But it is great to be able to meet in person again, but do remember to bring your face mask along to the service or some sort of face covering because they are mandatory now for people in the congregation. Um, you are allowed to remove them if you're doing a reading or leading prayers or if you're leading the service, but for everybody else, they are mandatory. Do check our website then, hopechurchfamily.org forward slash calendar and the weekly newsletter for more details of other services that are going on. Now, whilst it's great that our services in church are restarting, we're also very aware that a good number of you aren't ready to come out yet for physical services. So we will be continuing to provide these digital services for the foreseeable future. However, one change we've had to make just to tweak the program to create space to do both pre-recorded and live services for the weekend is that we're going to be stopping the daily prayer service as of this weekend. We thought long and hard about this. But for us to, to create that space, something had to go. I know it has been a help for a number of you, but the viewing figures have declined. And so we felt that it was an appropriate thing to stop. The Church of England does produce an online daily prayer service, and there'll be a link at the bottom of the screen and in your weekly newsletter if you'd like to make use of that. But a big thank you to everybody who's tuned in to daily prayer over the last few months, and to Sue and to Alison for helping out preparing the services. Before we turn to worship then, we're going to take up our collection, which is kind of hard on the screen, isn't it? But if you would like to give a gift towards our work, please visit our online giving page, hopechurchfamily.org forward slash giving, where you can choose which of our parish churches you'd like to support, and it'll tell you what to do next. And I've had some encouraging news from one or two of our treasurers over the last week that some of you are making use of this service. So thank you for doing that. It is a real help. Please continue to support us. Shall we worship? Let's quieten our hearts and invite God to meet with us. And all the responses you'll need for this will appear on the screen. O oh Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. And let's begin our worship by singing, Come people of the risen King. And why don't you stand for this if you feel able.
And as we continue to stand, we're going to pray together. Bless the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Do please be seated. Brothers and sisters, the Holy Scripture calls us in various places to acknowledge and confess our many sins and wickedness, and that we should not try to hide them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with a humble, lowly, penitent and obedient heart, so that we may obtain forgiveness of them by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, we ought to do so especially when we assemble and come together to give thanks for the great blessings that we've received at his hands, to offer the praise that's due to him, to hear his most holy word, and to ask him to supply our needs of body and soul. Therefore, I ask and call you all to approach the throne of heavenly grace with me, humbly and with pure intent, saying, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the evil intentions and desires of our own hearts. We have broken your holy laws. We have left undone what we ought to have done. And we have done what we ought not to have done, and thus there is no wholeness within us. Lord, have mercy on us, pitiful sinners. Spare those who confess their sins. Restore those who truly repent, even as you have promised through Jesus Christ our Lord. And grant, merciful Father, for his sake, that we may live hereafter a godly, righteous and holy life. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. And may Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. James Reed is going to bring us our first reading now. Our first reading is Romans chapter 10, a reading from verses 5 to 15. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness, that is faith, says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith, and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all, and richly blesses all who call on him. For Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How, then, can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful! are the feet of those who bring good news. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Well, thank you for that, James. I hope you noticed there in the reading the, the great promise. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's a verse to live by, isn't it? To remember. It gives us confidence in our salvation, a confidence that lets us sing a hymn like the one we're about to sing, a great, wonderful Charles Wesley hymn. And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Saviour's blood? Why don't we stand for this if you feel it? Well, before we have our sermon, here's our second reading. Our second reading 
is from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and, beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me! Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into a boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we want to learn what it means to step out of the boat with you. So by your Holy Spirit, speak to us afresh this morning that we may see where we need to walk more faithfully with you today. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. When my son James was three, we were playing one of those rough and tumble dad games you do on days out in the park. One of those ones where I grabbed him by the wrists and started spinning him round and round, faster and faster. And then suddenly there was an awful crack from his wrist and he started screaming and screaming and screaming. I've never heard him react like that before or since. Carol's sister, who's a physiotherapist, was there with us that day and, and she had a look at him. And while we couldn't be sure, I was absolutely convinced I'd broken his wrist. It made matters worse. It was a Friday evening. And if there's one place you don't want to go when you're living in London on a Friday evening, accident and emergency. And so we took the still crying James home and put him to bed, planning to get him checked over the next morning, which to make matters worse was Carol's birthday. There we are, the perfect Instagrammable birthday present. Anyway, by this time I was feeling pretty sorry for myself. As you can imagine, Carol was well impressed that I was probably going to ruin her birthday. And even more importantly, I probably damaged James's wrist rather badly. And so I went up into his bedroom and I just prayed for him. He'd gone to sleep by this time, thankfully. The pain and the tiredness of an exciting day out had probably left him completely exhausted. And, and I, so I knelt down by his bed and just began to pray, Lord, heal James's wrist, heal James's wrist. And I just went over and over again, saying that again, confessing how sorry and stupid I'd been. I've never been so daft playing that game again, I promise you. And I, I, tears started pouring from my eyes and I was in there for about an hour praying. And then the next morning, something extraordinary happened. James got up and his wrist was absolutely fine. There was no swelling, no bruising, no pain, no loss of movement. It was like it had never happened. I don't know if that was an extraordinary healing or maybe he just overreacted in the first place. But to this day, I thank God that James was fine that morning. I thank God for answering my prayer. Because Christians are meant to be a supernatural people. Those of you who've been joining us for daily prayer during lockdown, we, you know, we've been reading from the book of Acts. And I hope you've enjoyed reading those extraordinary stories of how the church grew. And one of the most amazing things about that growth is how often it is built around healings, extraordinary miracles, wonderful acts of God. The supernatural growth of the church goes along with the supernatural faith of God's people. What you look when you when you look at church history time and time again, you see that the church grows when people expect God to work supernaturally. And when we don't, he doesn't, and the church doesn't grow. 
because Christians are meant to be a supernatural people. And really it is very obvious from studying church history that that is the case. So it begs the question, why do we cease to be a supernatural people? Why do we become what one author has called us Christian atheists, people who believe in God, but act like he isn't there? Well, I think one reason today is that our culture doesn't do God. Our nation is all about science and order and predictability. Trust the experts. They never get it wrong. It's knowledge and not Jesus that's the hope of our nation. And it kind of has the effect of turning us into trained fleas. Now, now fleas are extraordinary creatures. If there was an Olympics for animals, the fleas would hold the high jump record. They can jump 150 times their own height. The current Olympic record holder for the high jump is Javier Sotomayor, said the Cuban athlete, said it a long time ago, I think in Mexico, 2.45 meters. If he jumped 150 times his own height, he'd clear the Eiffel Tower. The extraordinary thing is you can train fleas to forget how to jump so high. All you do is you put them in a tiny jar, only a few inches in height, and they start jumping in it. And of course, what happens is they bash their heads off the ceiling and they very quickly adapt to this smaller environment. They stop jumping so high to the extent that if you then later remove the top from the jar, they never jump so high again. They will only jump to the height of the container they used to. It's like they've forgotten what they were made for. They forget the extraordinary heights they can reach. And Christians can get like that, except our jar is science and knowledge and rationality, that cultural pressure not to do God, which has made us forget that we're meant to be a supernatural people and has turned us into Christian atheists, people who claim to believe in God but act like he's not there. Which is why I think this incident about Peter setting out, stepping out from the boat onto the water is so helpful, because it challenges us to become a supernatural people again. Let's take a look at it in a bit more detail. And we're going to start with the obvious thought that this isn't a Jesus miracle that we're expected to repeat. Elsewhere in the Bible, Jesus goes out and heals people. He does exorcisms and things like that. And he tells us to go and do the same. There's no suggestion anywhere in the Bible that we are expected to walk on water. As far as the Bible is concerned, water is for swimming and bathing. It's certainly not for walking. If you're disappointed about that, please feel free to go down to up to Marina later. Give it a try for yourself, but do remember to take a change of clothes. So what is this story trying to tell us? Well, let's follow the story through. It starts with Jesus up on a mountainside. He's praying. In, in fact, he's had a bit of a day. Earlier, he'd fed the 5,000 men, women and children with a few loaves and fishes. And the crowd had seized him and tried to make him their king. It was all, frankly, a bit awkward. Um, and to get time to process it all, Jesus sends his disciples off ahead of him across the lake. And then he goes up on the hillside to pray. And he must have been up there a good while because the disciples have made some quite considerable progress across the lake, all the while rowing into a headwind. Now, some people will tell you that the disciples were in difficulties on the lake, that they were about to sink. Sometimes I think they have a tendency to conflate this story with the story of Jesus calming the storm in Mark's gospel. Um, but there's nothing in the story to suggest that they were in difficulties. In fact, it's rather the opposite. What you've got here is a dozen guys, four of whom are experienced fishermen rowing what is probably their own boat across a thoroughly familiar lake. They're not in any danger. They're in their element. They normally fish at night. They're used to being out there. They're working hard at the thing that they have been doing all their lives. That's the context in which this miracle happens. And it's so, so important that we understand that. If we really want to understand this story, the key thing we've got to grasp is that this is a story about extraordinary things happening within the ordinary. It's a story about turning your natural into the supernatural. It's about bringing the power of God to bear in our most ordinary day-to-day -day circumstances. You see, Jesus is the Lord of all of our life. He's not just interested in us when we're in church or praying. He's not just interested in us when we want to go out and be missionaries or when we're worshipping to our favourite type of worship music. The Lord is the Lord of all of our life. He's the Lord of walking the dog and doing the dishes. He's just as much a Lord when we play sport as he is when we pass an exam. 
He's the Lord of Waitrose and your workplace. This is all about the supernatural coming into our day-to-day -day normal. How do we do it then? Well, we look to Jesus or we step out of the boat. Think what it must have been like for Peter to do that. He's a fisherman. He spent his life around boats. And what is the key safety lesson he will have been taught all of his life by experienced older fishermen? What will the experts have drummed into him day by day? Rule number one, don't try to walk on water, you'll drown. Rule number two, be extra careful in the dark. And rule number three, where the water is deep in the middle of the lake, don't try to walk on water in the dark. Just like the experts have drummed rules into us, things like, don't do God in public, whatever you do, don't mention anything controversial, don't take risks. And yet Peter takes a risk. He decides to do God in public in front of all of his mates. He looks to Jesus striding purposely over the water, completely in control, the master of the universe, the Lord of the lake. And he takes an incredible leap of faith and says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Imagine how his mates must have reacted. Eleven blokes in the boat. Peter, you've gone mad. Or, or do you think they just held a Christian prayer meeting and thought, yes, let's encourage Peter in his walking on the water endeavor. I don't think they'd have done that for a minute. They'd have thought he'd gone completely mad. Don't do it, Peter. You'll drown. It's dark. You're in the middle of a lake. We'll not be able to see you once you're under the water. But Jesus says, come. And Peter does. He gets out of the boat. He puts his foot down on the water. And because of the power of God, the water bears his weight. And he's able to walk on the water towards Jesus. But remember, this isn't a story about boats and water, which is good because not many of us have a boat. This is a story about your job. It's about your school. It's about your family. It's about your home. It's about your club. Wherever you spend your time, wherever you feel like you're in control, whatever is your current normal. Because the point is, you aren't in control, but God is. And he's inviting you to turn your place into his supernatural place, a place where the stuff that only God can do happens. He's inviting us to take the lid off our jar and see just how high he really made us to leap. What might that look like in your workplace or your school? Maybe it's about plucking up the courage to live differently, to refuse to go with the flow, to tell the truth when everybody else is lying, to be honest when everyone else is on the take, living distinctively. Peter, who took this step of faith, writes later in the Bible, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. But it isn't just about living distinctively. It's also about speaking up for Jesus and sharing your faith. A few months ago, I got to hear about a couple of sixth formers at Malvern Chase School who asked the school if they could run an alpha course there. And amazingly, the school agreed. And a great number of young people have been on that course and they've learnt all about the basics of the gospel. So please be praying for what God is doing there. A little thing like that can change lives forever. I'm going to show you a video later on in this service in which Justin Welby, the current Archbishop of Canterbury, talks about how he became a Christian. And it was all because a friend had the courage to speak to him about Jesus. Every time we share our faith, we're stepping out of the boat. And we really don't know how big an impact our act of faith will have. Another way of stepping out of the boat is to offer to pray for healing. When, when I was a curate, there was a lady in our church, not a, an ordained person, not a, a lay reader or anything like that. She was just a, you come in a garden, bog standard, ordinary Christian who had understood what it means to step out in faith. And she would do it on trains. She, she went on a train every day to and from work and she'd often get talking to people as, as you can do on a train sometimes, on a bus. And, and if they had a problem that they shared with her, she'd just come out and say, look, I believe in a God who heals. Can I pray for you? And 99 times out of 100, they'd say, yes, please. And so she would pray for them there in public on the train. Not so much stepping out of the boat as stepping out of the train, I guess. And we all know they warn you not to do that sort of thing. But we've each got a place like that where we meet with people and where we have that chance to offer, to pray for them. Maybe it's your workplace or your club or your school or just your home. 
Jesus is calling us to make our natural supernatural. What about the home? How do we start there? Well, I guess we choose to keep God at the centre of everything. In my own home, we make a, try to make a priority of prayer. We've always made an effort to begin all our meals with prayer and encouraging the children to get involved in leading those prayers too. We always read the Bible with the kids before bedtime as well. It's just been our way of countering that steady drip freed from school and TV and culture that says there is no God. Don't act in faith. Don't do anything controversial. Don't be seen to act out from the crowd. All those messages that limit our potential, that squeeze the flea jar ever smaller, limiting how high we can jump. We don't want to be Christian fleas. We want to be Christian high jumpers. Well, today Jesus is inviting you to take the lid off your jar. He's inviting you to discover just how high he made you to leap. But you won't unless you're ready to step out of the boat. Good news is Jesus is there to catch us if we fall. Did you see that in the passage? I love the way the Lord steps in to rescue Peter here. When it goes wrong, Peter steps out on the water. He walks a good way across the water. Let's not think that Peter doubted immediately. It must have been a pretty scary experience for him. And I think anybody who's ever stepped out in faith and taken a risk will know what it feels like to be out there seemingly on your own. But actually, you're relying upon the Lord and he's there to grab hold of Peter the moment he starts having those worries and make sure he's safe. He can do that for us, too. Whenever we start to sink, he's ready to grab hold of us. If you're sinking at the moment, he has his hands upon you. Let him lift you back into the boat. Keep you safe. We don't need to be afraid. We just need to step out of the boat, trusting our Lord. So you're ready to get your feet wet. Well, I'm going to stop there and invite you to metaphorically dip your toes into the water. We're, we're going to be quiet for a few moments. I'm going to pray for us all and ask God's spirit to guide us to the place where he wants us to become more naturally supernatural this week. And then it's up to you to take that step of faith. Shall we be quiet and let's pray. Father, thank you for giving Peter that courage to step out of the boat. Where do you want us to step out in faith this week? What's that place in our lives that we need to turn from the natural to the supernatural? The place where we should speak of you, the place where we should bring prayer to bear or point people to you. Show us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. Come and speak to us now. And show us where we can serve you this week. And just the quiet, let's see what the Lord has to say to us. Come, Lord Jesus, give us courage to step out with you. We ask all this in your name. Amen. So how are you going to step out of the boat this week? Why don't we carry on responding to the Lord by singing, I, the Lord of sea and sky. And let's stand for this if you feel able.
And as we continue to stand, let's declare our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, please do take a seat, and Reverend Linda Bedford is going to come and lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you come near and listen to us as we pray to you for our needs and the needs of the world. Almighty and ever-loving God, source of goodness and love, accept the fervent prayers of your people this morning and look with compassion on all who turn to you for help. Triune and Creator God, help us to contemplate you in the beauty of the universe, for all things speak of you. Awaken our praise and thankfulness for everything you have made and give us the grace to feel profoundly joined to everything that is, so that we may know our place as stewards and channels of your love for all creatures. For not one of them is forgotten in your sight. Enlighten those with power and money that they may not be indifferent, but may look for the common, go common good and advance the weak and helpless. For the poor of the earth cry out. Help us to be guided by your Holy Spirit to protect life and prepare for a better world, the coming of your kingdom of justice and peace. Father, we thank you for this beautiful part of the world in which we live, in all its abundance. We ask that we forget not those who have so little to eat and where the earth is scorched and dry. We ask your prayers too for all those caught up in conflicts around the world, in Syria and Yemen, Libya and the Sudan, and the Uyghurs in China, and the persecuted Christians in that country. And this morning we bring before you all those in Lebanon, all those in Beirut, the sick and the injured, coping with coronavirus and the dreadful explosion that has killed so many. Lord, we ask that you be with them in their suffering. Lord, in your mercy, we pray, Lord, for our world leaders that they may have wisdom and insight and breadth of vision for the good of the whole world and the good of the universe. We pray at this time for our church leaders, for our archbishops, Justin and Stephen, and for our bishops, John here and Martin. We pray for all clergy at this time as they struggle and work hard to enable the gospel to be shared with everyone despite our buildings being closed down. Lord, we bring before you our young people, our children and families, 
this difficult time. We pray that they may enjoy the summer, to be able to communicate with their friends and to look forward to starting school in September. We pray for all those who have responsibility for our young people, especially the teachers in our schools. Lord, in these strange times, our world has been turned upside down and we are in unfamiliar territory. Bewildered, we cling to old habits for comfort. Help us to remember that you are unchanging. Only you are unchanging. And in you only can we find our safety and security. And in you only can we trust. Look upon us with compassion and forgive our foolish ways. Help us to turn again to Jesus, our example, and to live in harmony with you and creation. Lord, in your mercy. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy. Sustain and support the anxious and be with those who are sick. Lift up those who are low, that we may find comfort, knowing that nothing can separate us from your love. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Heavenly Father, we bring before you those who are sick, in body, mind or in spirit, especially those who are close to us and whom we know. Remembering this morning especially Elspeth Longmore, Pam Morton, Sarah Chandler and Julian Fox, Adrian Taylor and his daughter and Sue. Lord be with too all those who are bereaved at this time, those we know Patricia Collins and Margaret Cooper and Cynthia. We pray too for all those who have lost loved ones in this pandemic or those who were not able to say goodbye properly. Help them in their grief. Help them to know your loving touch in the eyes and the hands of those who care. Merciful Father, I accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for that, Linda. Let's continue in prayer as we pray the Church's special prayer for this week. Almighty God, who sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of your Church, open our hearts to the riches of your grace that we may bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in love and joy and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And standing at the foot of the cross, let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, we're coming to the end of our time together, but before we sing our final song, I promised earlier we'd show you a little video produced by the Archbishop of Canterbury to inspire us to think about who we can speak to Jesus about this week, and indeed who we can pray to Jesus about this week. So let's take a few moments to enjoy this video. I'm back in Cambridge back to the days where obviously I worked very hard but I did spend a lot of time on the river rowing. I last coxed about 40 years ago. If you believe in prayer I suggest you say one now. Are you ready? Go! And if I say so myself after 40 years that was pretty cool.
Nick Hills and I were students together at Cambridge and we recently met to visit the college we were both at and take a tour. Hi Nick. Hello Justin. Very nice to see you after <laughs> and so you. long. It's very nearly 40 years, 40 years this year. You haven't changed. <coughs> it's a bit thin. No bit hair. Thin. Used to have hair. Used to have dark hair. Carry on with There had been quite a few changes, of course, but much of the college looks just as it did, in fact, as it has done for several hundred years. So this is the admissions oh. form, which every student has to sign when they first arrive at the college. My writing has not improved a great deal. Life was quite complicated. I put my grandmother's address. There were even some very familiar faces, although I have to say they looked for some reason a bit older than they were 40 years ago. We first met at a, a sort of reception cocktail party at the Missus. Ah, oh, yes. And you got me, you were at CMS at Crowther Hall. At the yes, I was, that's right. And you got me to go to Kenya. And Christ sort of made a decision to follow Christ. Having come back, they've been deeply influenced in Kenya. Yes, Profoundly sure. open to things in Kenya. Wonderful. And then in... And then, of course, you ordained me as a deacon and a priest. Of course. And sent me to Nuneaton. And you said to us, you've spent your lives doing things. It's time you went to be with people who had things done to them. <laughs> <laughs> I've never forgotten. <laughs> we headed over to Nick's room in one year when he was at college. A transforming moment happened. A life-changing moment. May, may I go in? Yes, of we go. Why don't you lead the way? All right. Because you used to live here. Thank you very much for letting us no disturb problem. you. You're very kind. Now that I'm told, you would be roughly on the end of the bed. And, um, which wasn't a bed. Which wasn't a bed. It was a sort of... Um, and we came back here, yeah, I sofa. think, about 10 -ish. On October the 12th, 1975, just before midnight, that having spent time talking and sharing speaking together, we sort of ran out of things to say and I realised that I was a point of decision about life and my life was going to go one or two ways. And I prayed a very simple prayer of saying, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I don't know anything about you, but come into my life. And he came in, something changed and has stayed changed from then on, with all the ups and downs and me trying to run away and good times in, the li in my life and really bad ones. And that started with you just as another undergraduate, very simply encouraging me to look at who Jesus was. I, I just can't imagine how different my life would have been. That's the extraordinary thing. You know, I went on, I went into the oil industry, but there was always this presence of God. There was always the reality of God. And in the end, there was that sense of call, which was by no means inevitable and was no, by no means inescapable. I could have said no, and God wouldn't have turned away from me. As you say, it's not about doing, it's about receiving the gift of his life and his love and his joy. Absolutely explicit, isn't it, just in that quote? Well, the next morning you gave me this Bible. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Cambridge, 1975. That was the verse that was the page that was open when I became Archbishop of Canterbury, when I was installed at Canterbury Cathedral in the St. Augustine copy of the Gospels that St. Augustine bought with him in 597. They said, do you want it open anywhere in particular? I said, yes, John 15, 16, from that moment. Isn't that extraordinary? That's terrific. It's a beautiful Bible. I've used it for years yes, and years. Yes, I exactly like it, and uh, I use it also day by day. When I think through my journey of faith, Nick wasn't the only person involved. In fact, far from it. I later learned that there was a particular person who had prayed for me every week since he knew that I was on the way, since I was conceived, that I might become a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ. I can't tell you how grateful I am to them. What an extraordinary, faithful and loving gift that was. But that's a gift that we can all afford. It's not a gift that any of us is unable to give. You explained the cross to me. 
And I obviously did explain it satisfactorily. <laughs> well, you must have done. I think I got the message. What I got was that I didn't have to do anything. Yes. That Jesus had done it all. It was a free gift rather than a gift with strings. And yeah, I think I remember saying, but it's going to ruin my whole life. And you said, no, it's not. It's going to make it. It's going to make it. Well, what's it made? <laughs> Who could you do this for? Who could you give that gift to? I'm inviting you to join me in praying for particular people, family, friends, working colleagues, whoever it happens to be. Well, wasn't that wonderful? Shall we sing our final hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven? And why do you stand for this if you feel able? Well, thanks for joining us in worship today. Do please invite others along as we join in worship week by week. And when you feel ready to join us for a real physical church service, there will be a service coming to your community soon. Do keep an eye on our website for more details of that. And if this is the first time you've worshipped with us online, I hope you've enjoyed it. We'll be here same time next week. And if there's any way we can help you on your spiritual journey during these strange times, do get in touch with me, Barry at HopeChurchFamily.org. We long for the day when we can all gather together again without face masks and things like that. But in the meantime, stay safe and stay prayerful. May the Lord bless us and preserve us from all evil and keep us in eternal life. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Why don't we finish by saying the words of the grace. <laughs> May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the Lord, and the